What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin and Markets. My name is Ansel Lindner, and happy Monday. Monday is Bitcoin Fundamentals Report Day. Every Monday, I put out a free weekly newsletter, and then I discuss it here on the live stream. So welcome if it's your first time. Like, comment, subscribe. I will look at the comments here in a little while down below. You can find all the links that, you know, required links or, or links that you want to join the community or whatever. Those are all down below. And if you want to support the content, you can go over to BitcoinAndMarkets.com, sign up to become a paid member. I appreciate everybody who supports. Speaking of BitcoinAndMarkets.com, let's just go right to it. This is where the free weekly newsletter comes out, as well as other things for premium content, uh, blog post stuff. We have a price forecast competition monthly, so you guys can check that out over at Bitcoin and Markets. Dot com. And before I jump into that, let me bring up bmpro.substack.com and just plug them. You can also get there by going to bitcoinmagazinepro.com. And I write here three posts a week. We have uh, a main macro post that goes out once, once a week, usually on Thursdays, but Wednesday or Thursday. And then I do two kind of deeper fundamental dives. So in the mining industry, I go through there and look at all the stats for the mining industry and make give some investor insights, charts of the day, things of that nature. And the other one that I do is the market that will be coming out tomorrow. And this is all about what's going on on chain metrics. You can see, go through some investor insights, all sorts of stuff. So anyway, check out bmpro.substack.com. All right, back to Bitcoin and markets. Bitcoin fundamentals report number 285. Always start out with a meme or a graphic, I guess. And this was the graphic I came uh, came across this week. It's by Charts BTC, longtime friend of the show. I've been using his images for a long time. He's a good follow on Twitter, so I recommend you doing that. But this is the different cycles. You can see day zero, that is the halving and the price after the having and leading up to the having you know prior and post having of course every time post having we go up dramatically and i don't think this time will be any different i mean why would this time be any different and let me just check my levels make sure i am going out okay all right so that is the front image then I have a snapshot of Bitcoin. Oh, let me just summarize what we, we're doing here for those that are new. Bitcoin Fundamentals Report goes through all the different sectors of Bitcoin, different parts of Bitcoin. So we have headlines, we have macro, we have price, we have mining, and then layer two stuff. Usually I'm talking about inscriptions these days, but uh, not from an inscription promoting side, but just an inscription watching side, watching what's going on in that side of the market. So... Up front here, we just have a snapshot of Bitcoin to get you guys caged in at the beginning. Weekly trend is pre-having. I think everything for the last month has really been pre-having. We got so overheated on the daily and the weekly charts uh, up into March, March 4th, that it's taken so long to come down. Now we are fully cooled off on the weekly. After this week, you know, um, after the halving, we can start marching back up because we are out of over bought territory on the weekly we'll take a look at the price chart here in a second all right uh, media sentiment is neutral network traffic is elevated we'll look at the mempool and and all that uh, fees mining industry is still growing all-time high difficulty uh, really right sitting at all-time high hash rate so the mining industry is continuing to grow days until having is four. I think it is going to happen about nine to 10 PM on Friday. That's Eastern time. It's going to be April 20th though, 420 UTC. I believe it's like zero 100 UTC. So people get their 420, but they also get a Friday, uh, Friday having. So pretty interesting section uh, price section is weekly price. We dropped almost $8,000 since the last issue, 7,700 over 10%. At the time of writing, it was 64,195. 
market cap still over a trillion, 1.2, 1.3 trillion. I don't know. I remember when we were over a hundred billion dollar market cap back in 2018. And it seemed like that hundred billion dollar market cap was a floor for the price for a long time. And then of course it, we ended up falling through that floor, but a trillion might be the new hundred billion for support. That's just an interesting thing to think about. Okay. Satoshi's per dollar, 15, 57, one finny, that's one ten thousandth of a Bitcoin or 10,000 sats, whichever way you want to say it, is $6.42. Mining sector, the last dif or difficulty adjusted last week, plus 4%. And at the time of writing, the estimated adjustment in eight days was 1.5%. Mempool it was sitting at 214 megabytes. That's up slightly, about 20 or 30 megabytes from last week but if you go back just like three months into january uh we're looking at 500 megabytes in the mempool so this is yes fees are high at ten dollars and 51 sets or 117 sats per virtual byte so fees are high but uh, mempool is not growing dramatically and like i said we will be looking at that down below low priority fee is nine dollars and eight cents so that's if you want if you're willing to wait an hour to get a confirmation if you have a no priority which means i just am going to make a transaction and wait till it gets uh, up you know confirmed that's going to be much lower than nine dollars probably four dollars i didn't i didn't look at that today okay lightning network capacity did increase by half a percent about 24 btc 45.72 Channels, however, dropped about half a percent, or we lost about 200 channels and down to 52,225. Bitcoin uh, Lightning Network has been, you know, over since I've been tracking this, it's probably a year now. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've been tracking these on the report. Um, it was consistently going down. And now we've kind of found this floor, maybe, of around 4,500 BTC and around 50,000 to 55,000 channels bouncing back and forth. So hopefully that's a floor. And as we continue in the next part of the bull market, we will see a much, much a lot more interest in the Lightning Network and stuff like that. I mean, we use the Lightning Network here on the show. So every month with our price forecast competition for members over on BitcoinandMarkets.com, uh, the winner wins $20 in sats over the Lightning. So check that out. Uh, it's great. Lightning Network is great. But there's just, you know, the demand right now is for safe haven saving, not for uh, spending. But that will come eventually. I mean, I will spend Bitcoin much more liberally at a million dollars of Bitcoin than at $60,000 of Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, it just it will come once we have stored enough value, then the, the spending will come. All right. Next section is, in case you missed it, really a lot of my content is being focused around Bitcoin Magazine Pro, spending a lot of time writing for them every week. So uh, I recommend uh, subscribing over there to get my, my takes. I link to the different things I do there, latest member stuff. Okay, headlines. Hong Kong. That's China, spot Bitcoin ETF. Yes, I realize that they have a different monetary authority in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, but it is under China control. And this is a China spot Bitcoin ETF. So mirroring the U.S. stumble around the Bitcoin ETF announcement, Hong Kong authorities did the same thing today. Rumor, rumors flashed that the ETFs were approved only to be contradicted shortly after that they hadn't made the announcement yet. <laughs> just like what happened with the SEC, at least that's what I understand happened this morning. These ETFs will be approved uh, as to not let China fall behind the U.S. in this important area. Differences in the Hong Kong ETFs. China has gone slightly further than the U.S. or you should, we should, I should say Hong Kong, but, you know, it's controlled by China, like I said, uh, by a approving not only a Bitcoin ETF, but also an Ethereum ETF. I think that is a big mistake because it will confuse their investors and dilute their investments away from Bitcoin proper into a scam token. These ETFs are also in kind as opposed to cash creations. I think they have both 
uh, you can do in-kind or cash creates. But Bitcoin, uh, or sorry, the U.S. only allows the um, cash creations. Now, this is interesting because when you redeem shares in the U.S., you have to sell the Bitcoin to get the cash. The cash is what's going in and out of the ETFs where uh, with in-kind, you have Bitcoin going in and out, or at least you can have Bitcoin going in and out. So that is a recipe for less volatility. So this makes the, the U.S. ETFs less efficient, but also allows for more oversight or overreach, however you want to look at it, of the market. So the more touch points where the regulators can regulate things. Okay, while I was writing, we had an update though. Eric Balkunis of Bloomberg, he uh, came out and said that they have been approved, but not to launch. Rumor has it launching next week, so as not to compete with the Dubai conference. Don't expect a lot of flows. I saw one estimate of 25 billion. That's insane. We think they'll be lucky to get 500 million. Here's why. Hong Kong ETF market is tiny, only 50 billion. And he had another tweet that said the all of the e Bitcoin ETFs in the US, they are bigger than the entire ETF market in Hong Kong. So that's just a little size comparison there. The Chinese locals cannot buy these. Uh, like mainlanders can't buy these. Uh, I think they can. They, they can put $50,000 through uh to to hong kong every year but they can't ape into them like they can and say if it was a shanghai listed product right the three issuers that were approved are tiny no big fish like blackrock involved the underlying ecosystem there is less liquid efficient these etfs will likely see wide spreads and premium discounts the fees will be likely one to two percent nowhere near the dirt cheap fees in the U.S. Terror Dome, because remember, most a lot of the ETFs are uh, fee free for the first year, and then they are going to be like zero point two five percent, and those will probably not be raised, at least in the foreseeable future. So zero point two five percent, or zero point two percent, or even zero point one percent on the U.S. ETF fees is a huge difference between like a one and two percent fee. But we'll have to see how that, that shakes out. Takeaway, other countries adding Bitcoin ETFs is no doubt additive, but it's nickel dime compared to the mighty U.S. market. And I 100% agree with that. I say I agree with his points here about being tiny in comparison, but I think people from mainland China can invest 50000 per year into Hong Kong. That limits the wholesale flood of flows, but this market might also appeal to South Korean, Taiwanese, or Japanese investors as well. Because I don't think there are those ETFs in those places. So they might be interested in going into a Hong Kong-based ETF. The spreads and fees are a great point, but Chinese investors are a captured audience. If that's their only option, they got to do it. I'll also mention that there's been a swarm into gold-related companies and exchange-traded products recently resulting in a premium of 30%. Remember, I reported on this either last week or the week before. Um, there is an ETF of gold-related companies, so it's not like a physical gold ETF. It's just like gold miners and maybe jewelers or, or something like that, importers and exporters. And that had a 30% premium because people were rushing into gold-related investments over there. The same thing last month, we also saw similar premiums in Chinese listed US related stocks. I think they have the S they have an S&P 500 tracking ETF and that hit 30% premium as well. So there's a lot of capital flight, a lot of people, a lot of hot money trying to get out of Chinese linked assets. Getting as far away from there, you know, going to, into gold, going into US related uh, products. So Bitcoin fits perfectly into that. So th this would be make it a hot commodity. The flow should be significantly higher than Eric's estimate of 500 million for the first year. He also estimated 10 billion in the first year for the US ETFs and we're already at 12 in the first four months. I think 
the Hong Kong ETFs will see uh, two to five billion in their first year. So if Bitcoin can make it to 20 billion or 25 or 30 billion, um, I think the Hong Kong ETFs can make it to two billion. Uh, but again, like he says, it's a, it's a little bit of nickel and dime. It's just overall, it's more access to Bitcoin. So very, very interesting what's going on there with the ETFs. Next story. And I'm going to maximize this for Telegram. I forgot to do that. Okay. Off exchange trading is huge for Bitcoin ETFs. FINRA ADF. Well, let's take a look at this graphic here. So this was put out by Bloomberg Intelligence. And you can see this is all of the trading or this is volume, trading volume by venue. And this large stick here is FINRA ADF. So FINRA. ADF is, quote, other than exchange trades, a facility that provides members of FINRA the capability to post quotes, report trades, and compare trades in M NMS, National Market System, stocks outside of traditional exchange environments. So this is kind of like over-the-counter or maybe even peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of this, but... They can make it's maybe simulates some sort of peer to peer, peer to peer type trades uh, using a protocol like this, uh, using this FINRA or this national market system protocol. I'm not sure, but it's very interesting that so much volume is happening not on exchanges. So if you can look down here, C CBOE, tiny, tiny, tiny amount of volume. Uh, NASDAQ couple NASDAQ here. Not much. We got these New York Stock Exchange. Okay. So a lot of off exchange. I wonder if this ARCA is off exchange versus just the plain NYSE probably. So a lot of volume going on off exchange, which is interesting. Okay. Next topic. Japanese firm MetaPlanet becomes MicroStrategy copycat. Linking to this article, but I believe this is a, yes, the, the story linked in the bullet point is Bitcoin Magazine. This image just comes from another source. So MetaPlanet, a publicly, a, uh, a publicly traded company listed on the New York, Jesus, please, on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, a diversified enterprise revealed the Bitcoin buying initiative on X. The company cited hedging risks from currency devaluation and inflation as motivations. And if you look at the JPY, which let's just go ahead and do that. If we look at the Japanese yen right now, where is it? Where did it? It's devaluing like crazy against the dollar up to 154 today. What was the high? 154.4. Um, so yeah, this is a big time currency risk over there in Japan, and this com this company is seeing this. Okay, the announcement said the purchase is an initial commitment and part of a broader embrace of Bitcoin's potential. Partners like legendary hedge fund manager Mark Yusko, who he has his you know issues with the Bitcoin space. He doesn't like the distribution of Bitcoin. Um, he thinks it's unfair that people got in before others and stuff like that. So, you know, he, he, he has been friendly to Bitcoin for a long time, but he does have some of these kind of out of consensus takes here. UTXO Management and Sora Ventures. I believe this is the Bitcoin Magazine related one. Okay. By adopting a Bitcoin treasury reserve similar to MicroStrategy, MetaPlanet aims to benefit from Bitcoin's upside while mitigating risks. MicroStrategy has pioneered the corporate Bitcoin treasury strategy, buying over $6 billion worth of BTC since 2020. MetaPlanet's stock price spiked 89.47% on Tuesday following the Bitcoin announcement. This reminds me of in the early days of blockchain, there were companies that were adding the word blockchain to their company name and their stock price would jump 
but this is way more legitimate. They're going the micro strategy route and going to buy, be buying Bitcoin as much as possible. Uh, very, very interesting. The move also provides Japanese investors indirect Bitcoin exposure without high unrealized gains tax, which can reach 55% in Japan. I did not know that they had this. I mean, I'm no tax expert. Even in the United States, I'm no tax expert, but um, that is a pretty steep unrealized gains tax. So this gives these Japanese investors a way to invest without that. So that is pretty spectacular. MetaPlanet's Bitcoin funds will be held in a tax-advantaged structure only accessible by the company. Pretty cool. All right, that was the Bitcoin headlines. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go in and check and see if there's any comments. Not seeing any comments. Let me check Twitter. Should be going out on Twitter as well today. Looks like the Twitter feed might have ended prematurely. Am I going out? Let me check Telegram. Hey, guys, am I going out on the other platforms? I'm hoping I am. It says I am live on Restream, so. Anyway, I'm going to continue on, and I'll check for your comments here later. Let me see. DT has a comment. Okay, DT says, ordinal having prediction. Massive fees to get your transaction or inscription into the having block. Oh, man. Yeah, uh, I saw something about a rare Satoshi, you know, being that whatever would be the first Satoshi mind in the new epic. Uh, so, yeah, there, there could be some of that for sure. All right, let's go on to macro headlines. Make sure I'm on there. Okay. I ran fear mongering. So this happened over the weekend. I didn't spend a lot of time listening to or reading the news on the weekend. I'm building a chicken coop in the backyard. So that's taken all of my time um, and sports with the kids. But apparently this was a big deal. Um, but the minute I read the headline, I, I discounted it. I didn't think anything of it. So let's read through this. Um, I just have to get this off my chest. <laughs> if your macro guy spent the weekend talking up the World War III threat, you need to ther seriously think about finding someone else to listen to. I was busy this weekend, only checking the headlines a couple times a day. But when I saw the back and forth, I immediately disregarded all the fear, fear mongering for a couple reasons. And make sure I did a couple because I don't think I did. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, okay. The... The price of oil is weak. In the two previous military conflicts, and we're going to go through a chart here. In the two previous military conflicts, Russia and the Israel-Hamas one, the oil price rose strongly to $95 a barrel. The pre-Russia rise was the strongest and actually presented a global threat, resulting in a price spike. So let's go down here. We can see the chart. This is the Russia one over here. It, the oil market anticipated because the market knows more than you. The market is pricing this in. It's not perfectly efficient. I'm not an EMH adherent, but it knows a lot more than you. And it can price in a lot more than what any single analyst or even, um, large investment bank or whatever, any more than they can consider. The market is pricing this in. And you can see that the market knew something was going on with this Russia thing. And once it, you know, popped off, the price spiked because it was a serious, legitimate geopolitical threat. But it didn't continue to go up. Why? Why did the oil price not continue to go up? 
If there was all this money printing, why did the, the oil price after the Russia invasion of Ukraine, why did it not continue to go up? Why did it, why did it stop at 130? Because the economy couldn't afford it. Because there wasn't as much money printing as what people you know, lead you to believe. The, it broke the global economy. And it went down. Okay, then the Israel-Hamas thing right here, last October. Uh, price rallied into that event. And you know, you're like, how could the market know about a surprise attack? It did. It knew. People knew about this. You know, they say that this was planned for a long time now. Um, people knew about this, and the market knew about it. And it rallied where? Right to that same level of the pre-Russian war. Or before the Russian war. 95. But what happened? It immediately fell. Where in this case, it immediately spiked because it was a real geopolitical threat. It immediately fell. What does that tell you? It's not, it was not a legitimate geopolitical event. It was somewhat manufactured. Okay. Now at this case, price rose again into this Iran-Israel thing. But it didn't reach 95. So it showed fundamental weakness going into this. And what has it done since? It's gone down. Let's go to a live chart. Because I think it fell even more today. So, um, is this the daily? Yeah, this is the daily. Okay. The daily is slightly uh, green for the day. This is my version of green candle. But it is not significant at all. And it's in a downward trend here. So, this is telling me that one, the buildup was much less dramatic. People didn't even think it was as big a deal. The market didn't think it was as big a deal. Let me correct myself uh, in the lead up. And now it's going down just like I did with the Israel Hamas stuff. So overall, the market is telling you that this is not geopolitical. It's not significant to the geopolitical order. And now you're seeing a lot of different takes out there that this was telegraphed. So the Iranians, their response was supposedly telegraphed out there. They didn't really do much damage on the their response or any damage really at all. So this is back and forth. Now they're, they're saying, oh, there's going to be another response from Israel. Who knows what the story is, but the market's saying it's not that big of a deal. Okay. Now, if you live there, of course, it's a, it's a huge deal, but I'm saying from a macro fundamentals perspective, this is not that big of a deal. Okay. Let's go back to the report. So I say the Israel Hamas situation saw a strong, but less rapid rise in the oil price because the market knows better than anyone, but no follow through. And that let us know it did not pose a significant immediate geopolitical threat. Back at that time, I remember responding to, what was his name? Something Elliot, uh, some macro guy, Elliot. And he was saying, oh, Bitcoin isn't a, a safe haven. It's not a geopolitical hedge because it went down when Hamas you know, invaded or attacked Israel where gold went up. So gold is the real safe haven. But what happened? No, everything rolled over. Bitcoin did a little bit. It started going up then after a couple of days. Um, oil, like I just showed you, went down. So this markets in general were telling you that it wasn't a significant geopolitical threat or a geopolitical event, at least yet. I mean, it can build to that, but it was telling us that that was not. And now it's... Same thing with Iran is saying that the weak rise barely making to 85 is saying the exact same thing. It's not, does not pose a significant immediate geopolitical threat. Okay. So this all tells me the situation is less. Sorry, one second. Sorry, 
Sorry, my son there. All right, so we went over the chart, and that's all I have to say about that Iran situation, other than I don't think it's going to uh, degenerate into World War III or accelerate into World War III, whatever you want to say. Uh, this is, The oil market's telling us it's not that big of a deal. Okay, next macro kind of cluster of headlines here is about China. So China's economy is much worse than it appears, dragging the whole world down with it. I believe China is in recession, even though their official numbers are saying, you know, four or five percent GDP growth. It's not. Those are we have known for a very long time that the Chinese GDP is has been drastically overstated. There was some people out there. I just read something or watched a YouTube video or something about the trying to estimate the actual GDP of China, because I think they say it's around 15 trillion. That's what they report. Um, but it could be like almost double what the actual GDP is because they fudged their numbers for so long. Uh, so I think they're in recession right now. There's a lot of stuff happening over there. And they are going to pull the rest of the global economy, including the United States, into recession. It's just going to be take a lot longer to get to the United States. And one of the kind of, I guess, uh, cornerstones of my geopolitical analysis is that the U.S. is going to become less and less integrated with the world. And so in the future, when China has a recession, it might not spill over to the United States. But at this time, everything is still very integrated. And so I think that the U.S. can't escape this either. I mean, Japan and Germany haven't been able to escape it, the U.K., so the U.S. is next. But anyway, these are the cluster of headlines around the China situation. So I saw this video this week, a uh, very, very good summary from this channel. I think it's, yeah, Business Basics. Uh, I think the video is, I don't know, 45 minutes long, but it goes into everything from their debt to their demographics, um, to their real estate market, to their currency, and just what, and to communism, I mean, it goes into detail and I think it's a very good watch. So I recommend uh, everybody that reads the newsletter, at least, <laughs> watch this video. Okay. Copper stockpiles are also building rapidly. And remember Dr. Copper, because he has a PhD in macroeconomics. So the copper stockpiles are also building rapidly. Um, this chart from Steno Research with Andreas saying that this is a sign of more economic activity. So that was a bad sentence, but let's take a look at this. So Chinese copper stock levels, you can see this year way out of the recent range here. Let's see, this is, I don't know what years this covers, but way outside the range. So, Steno says this is a sign of more economic activity. However, I see just the opposite. It is likely that they are importing relatively the same amount of copper, but their economy is in such bad shape that they are putting it into stockpiles instead of using it. So that's the copper. Lastly, for China this week, their FDI collapses to 1993 levels. In 2023, the total FDI flowing into the country was just $33 billion. And remember, China was built on FDI. It requires FDI. Everybody moving their factories over there and investing in China. That's what built it. And now FDI is stopping. I think on net, this is total flowing into the country but i think on net they're negative they're actually sending money investment out of china now and what happens to a ponzi scheme when it springs a leak yeah it crashes pretty quickly it's hard to keep it uh inflated that's at 82 percent less than the previous year and the least since 1993 according to china's state administration of foreign exchange and companies from Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea shrank their direct investments in China the most. Okay, and here's the chart. P 
peaked here 2021. I don't know why. <laughs> it's post COVID. We should have been deglobalizing. But other than 2021, you can see that it's been kind of sliding down for the last 10 years. And it's really fallen down in 2023. We'll see what 2024 has in store. Okay, so that is all the macro headlines. Let me check the chat, see if people are making some comments in there. Sup, Ansel? What's up, anime? Let me check Telegram, see if there's any comments in here. Jerpin says YouTube good. Thanks for checking, man. Uh, all right, let's go to Twitter and see if I can find any comments i really if you guys know where i should be looking for comments on this stream let me know because i'm just like looking in the responses here bots just bots all right back to it let's get back to it now Price is next. Probably what everyone's been wa waiting for. Now, my professional tier, I do put out market protons. I put out one last Monday uh, talking about stuff going into the halving. I was not necessarily bearish on price, but I was uh, not expecting a big price rally. And you'll see why for in this uh, in this post here. So getting into the charts. Throughout the entire month of March and so far in April, I've been a voice of caution about the price. I've been expecting price to cool, sorry, this is supposed to be off, to cool off on the weekly hand, oh geez, to cool on the weekly time. That's horrible English. What did I try to say? I expected it to cool on a weekly time frame, as it was still significantly overbought. Last week at this the time of writing the report, we were breaking above the pennant pattern and I said the following, I think price is setting up for a big move, just not quite yet. The having a significant is a significant event. While it is possible to pump into next week's having, I think it is highly unlikely. And if you look here, I put an arrow to last week's report right at the breakout time. That was last Monday. And I said, I don't think this is the rally that we all been waiting for. Of course, it was a fake out higher. Now, let's go see what else I wrote. I do not think that move higher was likely to come to anything that weak and that close to the halving. So it was weak and it was too close to the halving to be any significant move. The rest of the week proved that out. Price settled back into the pattern and then dropped below on geopolitical concerns over Iran and Israel. Whenever I see Bitcoin price movements driven on speculative geopolitical events, I question the knee-jerk reaction to the news. Nothing fundamentally has changed for Bitcoin. The Iran-Israel conflict was not foreshadowed in the markets or predicted by the markets like we just went over. Therefore, it is hard for me to believe they are very serious. And I saw another tweet, one the... You know, the younger CNBC host, the male guy, he uh, asked like, hey, Bitcoin is selling off on this Iran, Israel stuff. What's going on? If Is it a safe haven or not? And Jack Mallers responded a great, great response. And he said that um, Bitcoin is liquid. That's why it's sold. Like you can't like, let's say you have real estate and you can't decrease your risk profile by selling real estate all of a sudden on a Friday afternoon or something like that, right? You have to sell liquid things and Bitcoin being globally very liquid. It's very liquid. It's just as liquid on the weekends as it is on the weekdays. And so Bitcoin sells off because it is just so liquid compared to every other asset. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for price discovery. It makes it volatile. But the reason why some assets like, say, real estate, commercial real estate, why they're not volatile or as volatile is because they're just not liquid at all. So Bitcoin will take that store of value function away from real estate because it is so illiquid. All right. 
Moving on here. The move higher was weak and a fake out. I believe this move lower is weak and will ultimately be a fake out as well, driven by misplaced speculation about World War III. We will most likely hit the halving between 65 and 70,000 and then start moving higher from there. And one more look at this chart. Bounced up to the 50-day moving average. At the time of writing, 64, 64, 1. Let's take a look at the live price. And share this chart. So you see bouncing off the 50-day moving average. Really kind of at the lower bound of this channel. If we say this is a channel instead of a pennant. Um, not good to be under the 50-day moving average. But we will see what happens as we go into the halving. Um, there's still demand for Bitcoin with all the ETFs. There's growing demand. Mr. 100, I saw bought uh, several hundred Bitcoins again today. Uh, so there's lots of uh, insatiable demand out there for Bitcoin. And the halving is just going to put that much more of a crunch on the supply. All right. Let's go back to the report now. And I have the weekly. And I'm showing the weekly down here getting back to not being overbought. So 69 at the time of writing. It might be a little bit lower now too still within that kind of channel or bull flag, whatever you want to call it. Okay. I'm closely watching my favorite indicator for weak hands, and that is the short-term hodler realized price. Sitting at 69000 this means that breaking that level will likely trigger short-term holders, holders to sell. While this would be, tip, would be typical market maliciousness, <laughs> Because the market hates you. <laughs> the market does not want to give you easy gains, right? They want It wants to cause the most pain and make the obvious trade painful before it, make, it like gives you the gains, right? So <laughs> I just called it typical market maliciousness. Um, I still think it is unlikely to happen. So triggering the short-term hodlers is what I'm saying. I won't discount touching that level. But with the demand from the Hong Kong ETFs added to the U.S. ETFs, banks, and Bitcoin development companies like MicroStrategy and now MetaPlanet in Japan, any dip will be, be aggressively bought. And we also have a little bit more um, retail interest. And we will look at that when we go down below and look at the inscriptions. But here is the sh short-term holder realized price. You see it's still below the price by a significant margin but it's possible to go down there i think we touched 61 so there is possibility we touch 59 which could trigger some people to sell but overall any dip will be aggressively bought all right so that's it for price let's go on to bitcoin mining headlines here biden redoubles effort to crush bitcoin with eia's mining survey so Linking to this, this was on the EurasiaReview.com. Specifically, the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Where's the closed parentheses? They don't ever close the parentheses. <laughs> uh, the, the EIA is responsible for collecting, analyzing, and disseminating energy information. Sought what it deemed to be an energy survey of the Bitcoin mining industry's energy consumption. Now, here's the important... Hold on, stand by. All right. This is the important sentence. While the EIA's initial jurisdiction for the survey was debunked and the emergency data collection process halted due to a lawsuit, the agency is moving forward with plans for a slower, more deliberate survey of the industry. The survey's process, however, is still biased in that it focused only on the cost of Bitcoin mining out of context of any benefits the sector provides or the costs imposed by other sectors' electricity use. Thus, it is another weapon in the anti-Bitcoin arsenal of the Biden administration. All right. 
So that is happening. We'll see. You know, one of the things I think about these type of things is that they'll just orange pill people. The more people that look into Bitcoin, the more people that look into Bitcoin mining and all the different benefits and what are the costs and what are the, um, uh, I guess, benefits to the industries, to renewables, to all sorts of things, they're just going to get orange pilled. So, yeah, it's different if you're trying to get customer data or something like that, but let them do the surveys, let them do some data collection on it, um, push back on them. I mean, if don't, you don't have to give stuff away, just uh, don't ask any questions. Of course, I like that they sued and got this stopped, but, um, you know, in the end, if it does go through, it's just going to orange pill people. So next story, Bitcoin having will deal a $10 billion blow to Bitcoin miners. FUD. Hold on a second. My eldest daughter got home and now they're fighting. Okay. Um, more FUD about the having, and we'll get into some of this stuff here. So as the hoopla has revved up around the event, some traders are betting that mining stocks will fall. Total short interest, the dollar value of the shares borrowed and sold by bearish traders, stood at about $2 billion as of April 11th, according to an estimate from S3 Partners LLC. That short interest accounted for, hold on just a second, my Sorry about that. All right. So that short interest accounted for almost 15% of the group's outstanding shares, three times more than the U.S. average of 4.75%. Managing Director, Predictive analyst, Analytics at S3. So I say these shorts can get squeezed after the halving. Recent standout performers like TerraWolf, Hut8, and Cypher are less shorted than the big three. So here is this from that article. We can see Marathon is the most shorted by far. Clean Spark, which is, uh, they were number three. They just recently bit, beat out Riot to take the number two spot by market cap and Riot. All these guys have a lot of Bitcoin, and they are the three big, big guys in the industry. But very recently, the ones that have been performing the best are Terror Wolf, Hut8, and Cypher. And they are less, they are less shorted here. Marathon has a mountain of Bitcoin and the most shorting activity. It could be set for a massive post having rally. So I go into some of the post having supply and demand dynamics here. So some traders are expecting a bearish result from the having, as remarked on above. They believe if minor revenue falls due to a reduced block reward, they will be forced to liquidate some Bitcoin reserves in order to meet their costs. This Bitcoin will flood the market, pushing prices and revenue down even more. A downward spiral due to falling Bitcoin price and constant operation costs. That's what they think. Of course, miners are well aware that their revenue is sensitive to their selling. So they know if they sell that it could kick off this type of downward spiral. So will they do that? Will they purposely start kicking off this downward spiral? No, they will do whatever they can to not have to sell. They will raise money either through debt or equity. They could also put their Bitcoin up as collateral for a, for a loan to get them through the next six months or something, right? Um, just two weeks ago, there was a pretty big story about the banks themselves wanting to buy Bitcoin directly from the miners. So they could get sign some deal. Lend the Bitcoins to the miners or something more to the banks. Who knows? They can find ways to not have to sell the Bitcoin and kick off this downward spiral because they know their revenue depends on it. They know that's not in their best interest to do. So why would they do it? These short sellers aren't looking at this. Um, what these short sellers underappreciate is the slashing of new supply not only affects minor revenue, but the number of flows available to meet new demand. They see the downward feedback loop clearly, 
but they don't see that if miners can remain solvent through the first period after the halving, perhaps by borrowing against their Bitcoin instead of selling it, their theory blows up rapidly in their face. So they don't see the reverse. They don't see a possibility of how these miners could get through this. And I think it's very, the people shorting Marathon, I think are going to be in trouble. I really do. I think this is setting up to be a major short squeeze after the halving. Even if there is a period where the price dips, Marathon has stacked a bunch of Bitcoin that they can borrow off of, borrow um, against. So they are in no threat of going insolvent anytime soon. So these shorts could get squeezed easily. All right. That's all for the mining news. Let's get into hash rate and difficulty. So hash rate continues to uh, at around the all-time high with difficulty adjusting up 3.9% last week. It will be interesting to watch the hash rate after Friday's halving, but I expect less fireworks than seems to be the consensus out there. Miners are extremely professional and have a grasp on very deep fundamentals in the Bitcoin space from demand from different sources to their long-term strategy and runway, they see more than the average investor. So here is the hash rate. You can see it's up there near all-time highs, multiple points. This pink line is the difficulty adjustment up. And the average or the, the moving average of hash rate, whether it's seven-day or whatever, is increasing still. So overall, the network is healthy. Miners are healthy. And they're moving into the halving um, in a... I mean, it's not exploding higher, but it's gently rising, just like you would expect from a healthy market. All right, mempool. Mempool spiked on the 11th to very high fee levels, breaking $20 per transaction and 200 sats per virtual byte. While the absolute size of the mempool has not increased all that much, the urgency and fee sensitivity of the transactions have pushed up fees. You can, We can confidently say this is not due to inscriptions, but due to uncertainty around the upcoming halving. That's my, I can, I can say that with confidence, but you see March 4th here, we had this little tick up. And then on April 11th, we had this little tick up. Now, what happened on the price chart on those days? Well, March 4th was this all important day that we've been watching for over a month. And that has been the middle of this pattern. That has been the important level throughout this whole consolidation period. Now, what happened on the 11th? Well, price broke that important level, closed below it, then fell below the 50-day moving average and out of this kind of triangle pattern that we've been watching. So that was a significant day, and March 4th was a significant day. The most significant day on this, this chart right here are those two days, and they happen to also be the days in the mempool when the mempool spiked up so when the mempool spikes up expect volatility we were talking about this on friday um on the live stream friday that um in the morning i said oh i was watching what's going on at the mempool because of my bitcoin magazine pro stuff that i'm writing and I said, wow, look at these fees. Look at this. this just spiked all of a sudden. These, these fees went from pretty much $1 all the way up to $20. There's some major price volatility coming. And what happened? About two hours later, we start seeing this big fall coming down all the way down that we saw. The two-day fall started right after I made that comment on Telegram. So we can use the mempool to look for volatility periods where volatility is more likely to happen um let's go back to that see we're starting to get a little bit of color here as well today i didn't even look at the levels like that today but um yeah we are in a period where there is a heightened chance of volatility just be watching out for that and like i said here we're under the 50-day moving average so this is going to take a little bit to get up and break out of here all right so that is all of the mining stuff let's get into inscriptions so you know like i was saying they have all this demand from the etfs to mr 100 to microstrategy and meta planet to tether buying it for their reserves everybody seems to be buying bitcoin for their reserves and stuff um we also 
that's that's on the institutional side. We also have retail side, and we haven't seen a lot of retail FOMO or retail interest. Okay, well, I am using inscriptions as a gauge or barometer of speculative interest by these retail investors. In the past, we could have used altcoins, but altcoins are pretty much withering on the vine right now. Ethereum's gotten down to 0 0.048, and there's no thing, there's nothing to stop it, no reason to think it's going to stop. So altcoins are withering on the vine. So what can we use? Like we used to use altcoins in the past as like maybe a gauge of speculative interest in this space. What can we use now? Well, we can use inscriptions. That's my theory here. And we'll see how this works going forward. We'll continue to watch this and, and update this theory as needed. Um, so as you can see in April, inscriptions has picked up for, or picked up from, over the two months prior, but are still well below the peak. This could be a sign that basic retail demand is beginning to get excited again about Bitcoin. So let's take a look at this. See February and March were low. April has now been higher, especially the last week or two have been significantly higher. Um, so this could be a sign that there is some speculative interest coming back from the retail side of the house. There are also some rumors that Roger Ver and Associates are actively attacking Bitcoin uh, with spam, like he did in 2016 through 17. There was, there has been a little uptick in big blocker activity lately. Uh, but if that is the case, it is a huge waste of money. And once again, Roger will be on the wrong side of history. And let me take a look at this. These are uh, ordinal fees paid over time. See the spike recently, daily fees. So the, this high daily fee right here looks to be about $3 million per day uh, wasted. <laughs> wasted because these ordinals and NFTs and, and inscriptions really have almost zero utility and zero long-term productive value. And so... Uh, this is $3 million spent for maybe a couple hundred dollars of entertainment. That's about the utility value of it. So um, that is pure waste. And if Roger Ver is behind it, he is just wasting money. And that is the end of the issue. Let me go check the comments and see what's going on. Not seeing any, any comments. 84 viewers. Guys, like, comment, subscribe. I'm going out on YouTube, Rumble, Telegram, and Twitter. So you guys can find the links to everything uh, on the website. If you go to bitcoinmarkets.com forward slash find dash us, you can find all the links. If you just find the YouTube channel or the, um, the Rumble, the description will have all the links you need. And Telegram, of course, is the community that I hang out in pretty much all day. We share Bitcoin stuff. We share memes. We share uh, macro headlines uh, all sorts of stuff that news related to this as well so demographics or stuff about the geopolitical situation btc moon guy love the show thanks man thanks for being here hope your week's getting off to a good start let's uh go to telegram and see if there's any comments in there nope and last but not least let us check twitter See if there's any more comments. It was just bots earlier. That's all I can see. Okay. So that's going to do it for today, guys. Thank you for joining me. Check out BitcoinandMarkets.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Ansel Lindner. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye.